Uh, colleagues, we have a uh, 10 minutes or so for, for questions now to, to speakers who've, who've just presented. So I'll just ask again if you could just announce who you are and speak loudly so we can all hear. But let's have some questions for the presenters who'd like to kick us off. Hi, Neil Harris, Cranfield. It's really for the, for, for, for the last speaker was if you look at the data flows for some of the other systems we're looking at, what year would you put them in, in terms of what the Met Office was doing? You, you see what I mean? And what can we learn from how the Met, of, Met models were running 20 years ago, 30 years ago, for the other systems we're talking about? I think they should be live, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so is the question, what was it like 20 years ago? The, 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 I'm just trying to understand what your question. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know where all the other de all the other s systems we're talking about are in terms of the data of the MET models, but it strikes me that the data flows into them are substantially less than the MET office. So there is this time lag in terms of what you were doing 10 years ago is relevant for the Forestry Commission or whatever it might be. Oh, and I see. Yeah, so we, we have different sort of, so we, we run the models in real time, as you saw there, and ingest the data in real time, but there is an awful lot of work looking at historic data and also projection in climate, and clearly there's a lag in that, right? Um, but, we're, but every decade we're catching up, if you see what I mean, as, as the computers get larger or our science gets better, then that lag which you describe gets, 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 gets shorter. But for real time, 24-7, um, um, for you know military operations, for f aircraft, etc. It needs to be pretty. We don't. We can't afford any time lag. Like. It has to be pretty instant. Good afternoon, James Copeland from the National Farmers Union. Um, we currently have around fifty-five thousand uh, farming businesses or data users uh, of all this fantastic information. Um, as someone that doesn't necessarily come from the data side of it, but very much the, the practical industry side of it, how do we ensure that all these different models and data sets and decisions can actually result in meaningful um, practices on the ground so that decisions that those businesses, whether it's at field, family, or farm level, are actually going to deliver some of these outcomes and these goals? Um, we, we've had a lot around the, the, the access to data, but it's about making sure that potentially these types of actors are involved at the outset. How important is that? And how do we ensure that we do that, uh, considering some of these actors don't all have digital access, let alone mains electricity in some circumstances? Thanks, James. Who, who would like to have a go at that? I, I could say some, in, in terms of, say, environment agency and instant, so flood instant response would be a good, a good example of where, you know, large um, cross-section of community are affected uh, and that will be a range of people from you know those that understand the science and th those that don't have that background and um, from our point of view uh, we are very much about providing a service to, to that community so it's about getting warnings out in, in good time and obviously where we do have an incident we have uh, staff working with the associated services on the ground and obviously uh, where there is an incident we then take account of you know what has actually happened in in addition to sort of the surveys, we, we talk to um, stakeholders who have been flooded, find out what their experience was of, you know, was the warning timely, did it give them the right information, and, and we've learned a lot by doing that. So you're absolutely right. How we communicate what we derive from our models is absolutely essential because people have got to understand it. it's all very well that we can take weather data, do a, a forecast of what's going to happen in a river, and then issue a, a warning, but actually that's got to be meaningful for the end user so they know that do I really need to put like, that stuff upstairs? Do I need, you know, do I need to tell my neighbour what, what do I need to do? And, and that communication is uh, is is yeah, absolutely essential because in a way, nothing else matters. <laughs> it's the people at the end that are most important. So we take that very much to heart. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah transdisciplinary is absolutely critical here. And um, it was interesting. The UN Secretary General declared that warnings for all for everybody on this planet should be an endeavour. So we went to the Pacific Islands because. I was part of that UN team. And we asked them, what is it you need? And they said, we need you to predict birds. 
And what he and she meant was that we rely on the movement of birds in order to protect ourselves. And what he was talking about, El Nino and La Nina response, full, full natural, natural response. And so therefore we now predict birds for the Pacific. And then they relate that and can communicate in the way that they understand. They didn't want all this massive data. They don't want this, you know, d detailed analysis. They just want simple language they can take action. Thank you. Um, another question. Did I see a hand over the back there? Is it Yes, thank you. Thank you. Somebody earlier um, in a previous talk talked about integrating some of the work with key stage three GCSEs and A-levels. Um, and I'm just interested to know if any of you are actively considering how we make sure that school kids keep up with these um, vast changes and the speed at which technology is changing, and, and whether you're involved in schools. Thank you. Thank you, very interesting question. I think skills, skills is key to this, isn't it? Paul, I wonder if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, um, that's funny you say that, because that's part of our Sentinel project, that Sentinel Treescapes, where we're looking to take it in the future, is into schools and have these sensors in a school, a school environment, they're, they're private areas of land, often have trees, so we can have a tree talkers um, in that area. And it also creates um, engagement with the scientific community at an early age, puts them into cutting edge development, looking at, okay, Internet of Things, sensors. Um, obviously, the curriculum is vastly different to when I was there with programming, et cetera, et cetera, being learned from, you know, my little daughter started looking at programming. So, you know, it's... It, it is changing, but being able to um, work with that resource is something we're definitely looking at um, expanding with this PhD student in our Sentinel project. Because you're right, you need to keep at the grassroots, you need to keep at that level of the, the, of the new scientists, the new, the new brains. Um, well, we have to. Paul, Paul thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Juan, you, you showed a, a range of incredible technology scanning in the woods and so on. How, I mean, how do you, how, how can we train the next generation to, to, to be aware of these technologies and to use them? What's the best? Well, I, th I think the I think the next generation are very familiar with, uh, or they have been growing in a digital environment. The problem is the analogic people that haven't had the same opportunity, or they are struggling to understand some of the concepts. So, as I was saying. In the in the in the in the last uh, wagons of this this train of knowledge, uh, there are people even waiting in the station. They haven't boarded the, the train yet, and uh, these people that are important if we want to transform the British landscape the way we we are planning, and uh, <clears throat> it is important to get uh, this uh, this key, you know, that they will allow us to communicate better with, uh, with them and uh, then get their, their feedback because they will feel they are on board. Otherwise, well, it's going to be, it's going to be more challenging, more difficult. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, may, may I just ask the microphone back, please, to the questioner? Uh, may, may, may I just ask your, your view as well? Kriti, if you could just bring the mic back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree. I think it's a very difficult um, question because things are changing so quickly and curriculums in schools are, 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 are slow to change or if they do change, sometimes they change too quickly and the teachers can't keep up with them. Um, I mean, I'm old enough to, to, to remember pre-PC um, and so therefore I've seen a lot of these changes over time. Um, but I think things like using Minecraft and getting people involved at really early ages is, is great because you get an enthusiasm and an interest in, in building systems. Um, but how you take it from that simple way to some of the, um, the, the big data ideas, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a challenge for us all. 
<laughs> um, yes, please. I just pick up. Uh, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, uh, my colleague Chris Skinner is involved in, in just that sort of project. In fact, using Minecraft and other gaming platforms to help encourage young people of all ages, uh, to, you know, who have that interest in sort of gaming, to see it as a as a as a, a way of not just learning but also just interacting with kind of things like Flood Million. In fact, he's developed his own. Mm -hmm. set of YouTube uh, videos uh, as part of his research, but it's also links to some of the work that we've been doing in the Environment Agency. Um, so he was one of our colleagues who was at the Science Museum last, mm -hmm. last month, um, giving demonstrations and so on. So I think you're absolutely right. It's engaging with the sort of technologies that are familiar to, to that, uh, you know, that part of the population. And, and maybe making better use of things like um, school-level hackathons as well mm -hmm. as competitive activities. Very good. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for another one or two questions. So uh, who'd, who'd like to put one forward, please? Yes. Good afternoon. My name's Chris Baker from Rothamsted Research. So uh, a few years back, I saw Tim Berners-Lee give a presentation on this stage. Uh, he was a proponent of uh, semantic technologies for data integration. Um, so with respect to uh, all of the advanced modeling that we're seeking to achieve, there are presumably some bottlenecks in integrating data. And I'm really trying to sort of get a handle on um, the extent to which uh, standards specifically semantic knowledge models, ontologies, et cetera, are critical to this uh, endeavor of prediction. Uh, I mean, effectively, if you can't integrate the data, you can't reuse it, you can't make it uh, an analytics ready or whatever you want to call it, or fair data. Um, so to, to what extent, really, are we still at a bottleneck with adoption of standards for integration of data versus our predictive capabilities or leveraging HPC. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Chris. Um, semantic technologies and standards being a bottleneck. Colleagues. <laughs> 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 Any thoughts on, uh, I mean, Paul, what sort of standards are being used to deal with all this <laughs> massive data that's coming in? Has it had to be a new science of standards as well as the I guess that what we're working on at the moment that has a standard and has a policy derived from it coming in in, in November is the um, biodiversity net gain and using the, the natural England metric tool that's kind of forced us into that, that standard. I think our bottleneck, to, to look at the bottleneck side of your question, and somebody alluded to it earlier in a question at the last panel, is um, skills. You know, people, skills, it's, as a remote sensor, you're doing remote sensing projects, you wanted to upscale them, you think, I need more remote sensors. But actually, no, you need more DevOps people, you need more data people, you need more people that have different skill sets to your traditional skill set. Um, and that comes back to the educational piece, making environmental jobs a tech job, you know, making these, um, these technologies and these data scientists are really going to be hugely important. So that's our bottleneck, um, is just the skill sets to, to use, um, free up this data. Um, what about the, uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, what about a view from the, the, the Met Office on standards for the sorts of data sets you're, you're working with? Well, it was back in 1950 when we, um, as a global community under um, WMO, which is a UN special agency, we all got together, 192 countries, and we, sent, we, we, we agreed that we need to share observation data because if we didn't, and if we don't have access to Brazil's data and they don't have access to ours, we can't produce a forecast. So we agreed the standard by which we can exchange observations. We, we have been we stuck to that and, and we police that and we monitor that. Um, so in that sense, we, 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 we do that. One, one thing I'd, I would be interested in people's comments on this as well as we embark artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's, it's becoming ever increasingly important that the quality of the data and the algorithms which are used um, is, is, as a, is a scientific endeavor and standards that need to be adhered to it because we're starting to see that people on, there's a misinformation coming through from some of the output that comes from that. And, and, and I welcome that sort of push towards standardizing and ensuring the quality assurance of that, of the interpretation of that information is really critical now. 
and maybe there's a bottleneck in that as well, perhaps. Um, I don't know, but yeah, there is, and I endorse your point about skills as well. I, 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 I've noticed that a lot, and my, te my wife is a teacher, and, and one thing of trying to, the other question about how do you get the youth involved, um, we've, we, we sort of embraced the idea that schools have their own observation system, you know, bring a, bring a Stevenson screen into the mm. garden and let them observe the weather. And then, then they may be more interested in understanding how it unfolds. And you start really small and really simple and let it grow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. Um, Paul Brown, Juan Suarez, Martin Borthwick and Paul Davis, thank you very much for your presentations. A big round of applause for them. Thank you. Thank you.